Okay, we're about to dive into our Bibles. We're starting a new verse. I'm so excited. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to be in verse 6. Moving on to verse 6 tonight. But before we begin our Bible class, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's a time to use the rebound technique if needed. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments and I'll finish this out in a group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we're delighted to have our freedom and be able to come together as Christians without persecution. Pray that you go forward with us and in your word this evening, make it a source of encouragement and also challenge. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Verse 6 is a fairly easy verse, and in my New King James Version is a fairly good translation, so we're not going to have to do a lot of exegetical work. Let's take a look at it in verse 6. It says, from which some. And so he's talking about the teaching ministry and the purpose of the teaching ministry. He's saying, uh, from that, some are going to separate. He says, from which some, having strayed, they've gotten off base. They're missing the mark. They're on the wrong path. They've strayed away from the teaching ministry and the purpose of the teaching ministry, and they're, they're, they're on the wrong path, he says, having turned aside to idle talk. Empty talk would be better uh, because the word for idle is the word, same word we get from vacuum, matiotes, uh, emptiness. And um, he goes on in verse 7 and says, desiring to be teachers of the law. And so they want to go into teaching the Mosaic law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they dogmatically teach is what it says. And so... They've gotten off base, and they're trying to teach the Mosaic Law. And before we get into our doctrine, which is going to be the doctrine of intercalation, I want to give you a timeline just to orient you to not only our verse, but why you're alive. So, let's In the beginning was God, and God existed independent of time and created matter. And so when you talk about time, you, you talk about uh, creation, and God didn't have time, he didn't need time. He is eternal with no beginning and no end. And that's the reason I like to draw the Trinity uh, and the fact that they cohabited together in eternity past, co-equal and coexisting, having the exactly, uh, exactly the same attributes. And so when you look at God here in eternity past, and uh, my kids, uh, we always drew a timeline. And they say, well, draw the timeline for God. And I... Well, you can't. You have to go into a circle. And then that represents eternity past. And we know at some point in time, God determined to create. And he came out of his circle, eternity past, and created angels. And we know that was the very first creation. And... uh you, if you're smart, you ask the question, well, if God knew there was going to be in all this mess, 
why would he create in the first place? And uh, the answer is, the theological answer is to glorify himself for the manifestation of the unity of his attributes. Now that's theological jargon for saying he was going to share his glory with not only angels but man and thereby be glorified. When, when angels could see God as he is, perfect, perfect in essence, God will be glorified, and there's nothing arrogant about being glorified when you're perfect. God is perfect. And then when man could see God and dwell in his presence and be in the presence of perfect almighty God, God would be glorified. And so you have the original creation, and the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the one who spoke millions of angels into existence. He created everything we can see and the things we cannot. Principalities and powers is what it says. And then God created the universe. In Job 38, 7, it says that the Beneha Elohim, the sons of God, the angels, angelic creation, shouted for joy as Jesus Christ laid the foundations of the world. And the Bible says that he also spoke and created the universe. And uh, isn't it amazing? Uh, in two different verses, in Colossians you have the verse that says, Katizo, he to create, and it's in the aorist tense, in a moment of time. Bam! And uh, in Genesis 1.1, it says, There is he, bara Elohim. Uh, in a beginning, God created. And uh, the, the scientists, they, they began to, they've made telescopes and they're looking out there at the universe and they're trying to find the edge of it. And they, they found out that if you look out this side, and the earth is not in the center, by the way. And you look out this side of the universe, and the universe is expanding outward. And then they change directions, and they look this way, and the universe is expanding outward. And so that at a high rate of speed, all of these planets and stars and solar systems are all expanding. And they're trying to find how big the universe is, and they still haven't figured it out. Every time they make a more powerful mic uh, telescope, they, f they say it's bigger than we thought. And light years and light years and light years of solar systems and planets and creation is expanding. And they call it the Big Bang Theory. They say there was some... Uh, huge amount of energy that was released all at once boom to create the the worlds in which we live the world which we're talking about the universe the heavens and so this creation we don't know how long see we don't know how long ago angels were created and we don't know how long ago the original creation of the universe happened. Hundreds of thousands of years. And if you look at the fact that the dust that makes up most planets, or just like if you look at Saturn, you see a ring of dust around it. It is the original creation and that created matter that Jesus Christ spoke into existence all at once settling down. And you have planets and stars and other things. And so this is, these are things that have been around for a long, long time. But then you have an event in it. The event is outlined 
in Ezekiel 28, in Isaiah 14, 13 and 14, and Luke 10, 28. And that event is one in which there was a revolution. And also in Revelation 12, 4. And we know that the highest angelic being was named Lucifer. And he revolted against God's authority. And he convinced one third of all angelic creatures to fall with him, to revolt with him. And because of this revolution, God says, okay, you've made your decision. Now, Lucifer, I am sentencing you to the lake of fire forever. And why did, why did uh, Lucifer not go immediately to the lake of fire? Because there was an appeal. An appeal to the sentence. An appeal that said, how can you, God, a loving God, throw your most beautiful creation into a lake of fire forever? In other words, Lucifer appealed to the love of God. God said, I will show you. And justice is the point of approach to God. So, over here you had Genesis 1.1. 1, 1, original creation. God did it perfectly. No problems whatsoever with it. And then in Genesis 1.2 you have the restoration of earth and the placing of man on the planet. So, there's your very first dispensation and it starts with Adam and it's the Dispensation of the Gentiles, we call it. And it runs over from Adam all the way over into the patriarchs and finally Moses coming off the mountain with the commandments. So you have a transitional period here between the first physical Jew, Abraham, the first genetic Jew, Isaac, and the introduction of the Mosaic Law. Then you have the Jewish age. Jewish age. And that began with Moses and the law, and it ran over to the dispensation of the hypostatic union, which is 33 years right here, where God walked on the earth. And then you have Acts chapter 2, and the beginning of the church age. And that is where we are now. And the next great event will be the rapture of the church. Seven year tribulation. Then the return of Christ. So. You see that man is a latecomer on the scene. Original creation has been around for a long, long, long time. God placed man upon the earth to resolve a spiritual battle that started between Satan and God, giving man the very same volition as angels. He will prove that man will choose his plan over Satan's. 
and in every dispensation of time, whether you're looking at the age of the Gentiles, the Jewish age, the hypostatic union, the church age, God, God the Father, is drawing evidence from mankind in the appeal phase of Satan's trial. Now, do you know why man exists? Man exists because God created him for a reason. You are here for a reason. Your existence is not a mistake. You're here on purpose. God imputed soul life to your physical life the moment you were born in this life for a reason. You see that? He, he wants to point to you like Job. Have you noticed my servant? See, you're here to resolve the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. Now, until you get that in your head, your life is going to be lived without reason, without purpose, and without definition. You're simply here to make money. You're here to do whatever. You're here to, you know, whatever the other reason is. But until you get in your mind that you are here to resolve a spiritual battle called the angelic conflict, your life is going to be chaos, really. It'll be full of de depression. And did you know that in the angelic conflict that a believer who recognizes that he's here to glorify God in a spiritual battle, he can do it when he goes to work. And you can glorify God in your thoughts and your speech and your actions at work while the economy's great. And you can glorify God by having even nice things. But did you also know that if the economy goes in the dumper, and we start heading off the cliff like a snowball headed for you know what. Guess what? Since you're living in a spiritual battle and your purpose here is to glorify God, you can also do that at that point in time. And therefore, you, every day you wake up, you've got meaning, you've got purpose, and you've got definition to your life. So, our verse says that these teachers had gone astray. They had began to want to teach the Old Testament, the Mosaic Law, and they had veered off the path. And so we know in the church age, let's take a look at something else. Need to type this. In the age of the Gentiles, they had the inherent law. It was a spoken law. It was given down through generations from fathers to the sons. They communicated Bible doctrine to their sons at the dinner table while they're hoeing in the field, while they're skinning the animal. They're communicating. It was a spoken law. It was not written. We don't know what all was in it, but we do know some of it because Moses functioned under it. Uh, excuse me. Noah functioned under it. And what did he do? He had sacrificial animals there on the ark that he offered to God. Job functioned under the inerrant law. He prayed for his children, didn't he? So we know a little bit about it, but not a lot. In the Jewish age, there is the Mosaic Law. 613 commands. It's 10, and it started out with 10, didn't he? Came off the mountain with 10. Freedom Code ended up with 613 commands to Israel. They function under that, and it, it was recorded in writing, and we still have it. 
but then a event happened that no one could foresee. Yes, the uh, crucifixion of Christ was foretold, and if you were a, a master of the scriptures, you probably would have realized that Jesus had to suffer. Suffering servant of Isaiah 53, 700 years before the cross. But what happened in Acts chapter 2? God the Holy Spirit came down and indwelled every believer. And believers evangelized in languages which they did not know. And look at that. Why did it happen? So we had the changing. And we went to the church age and mystery doctrine. And that's rules for living in the church. So let's look at why the church age started. Why these teachers were so far off base. There's nothing wrong with teaching the law, but dispensational orientation is very important. You got to know where you're at. The doctrine of intercalation. That's a big fancy word, expensive word. Things dropped right in, inserted. Why are we here in the church age? Oh, it didn't. Did everybody get that terrible diagram? Where? Point one of doctrine of intercalation. It means insertion. Intercalation means insertion. The Jewish dispensation was interrupted by the insertion of a new dispensation. Why? Because of his strategic victory, that's Jesus Christ, he was presented a third royal patent, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but he had no royal family to complement it. Therefore, God the Father intercalated the church age to form a new royal family to complement Christ's third royal patent. Well, that's a lot of doctrine. I'm going to have to stop and teach us a little bit. It's amazing how the lines can get blurred and even in the Gospels, if you're just a Bible reader, Jesus taught out of four different dispensational backgrounds in the Gospels. And unless you're ready to separate them, you, you're going to have trouble. Let's look at a whiteboard again. Jesus is three kinds of royalty. This is easy, but you need to see it many times to be able to memorize it and know it. First of all, Jesus Christ is royalty as deity. He is God. The Bible says that he is icon, the exact image. 
he tells the disciples, if you have uh, seen me, you have seen God. And so as deity, Jesus Christ is royalty. Who is his royal family as deity? God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And what is his title as deity? And in the Bible, he's called Son of Man. So that is the first royal family. And that is, when you see in Revelation, it says, and on his head were many what? Crowns. There's the first one. Secondly, he is Jewish royalty. He was born right into the line of David from both sides, his mother and his father. Who is his royal family? Not only Jewish royalty, but Jewish believers. So we got Old Testament saints and tribulational believers. Okay. And then as Jewish royalty, he is the son of David. He is the root of Jesse. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. I like that one. So there is this second kind of royalty. But Jesus Christ is a third kind of royalty. And that is battlefield royalty. And because of his strategic victory of the first advent, he was given the title of King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But here's what you're going to notice. Jesus Christ had a royal family as deity. Who was it? God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ had a royal family as Jewish royalty. Who was it? It's not only Jewish uh, royalty, but also Jewish believers. But Jesus Christ had a third kind of royalty, battlefield royalty, and because he won the strategic first, first advent, God the Father gave him a new royal title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's going to be, uh, he's going to fly that banner on the second advent. But there's no royal family to complement that third royal patent. You see that? There's no royal family. So God the Father dropped the church age right in to complement that third royal pat. Now you get point number one. You should get it better now. So you have church age believers. This should communicate a little bit better. 
because of his strategic victory. That's the first advent. Christ was presented with a third royal patent, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's Revelation 19, written on his thigh. But he had no royal family to complement that title. Therefore, God the Father intercalated. He dropped the church age in to form a new royal family to complement Christ's third royal patent. Are we good? Let me let me erase this and then do that again. Okay. Point number two under the doctrine of intercalation. The new dispensation inserted was the dispensation of the royal family of God. It generally derives its name from the from the classroom, its classroom, Ecclesia Church. It is the only dispensation in which believers assemble and meet together without portfolio. That means you don't have to have any credentials to walk in. You can come in from just having dug a ditch all day long or stepped out of the Oval Office. There is equal, equal ground in Bible class. When the royal family meets in the local church, they have no rights or privileges, only the opportunity for concentration on the teaching under the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. One teaches, that's the pastor teacher, all learn. That is why it's called the church age. It is better termed the age of the royal family of God an absolute unique age. So the dispensation in which we live is called many different titles, the mystery age, uh, the dispensation of the grace of God. You can even call it the dispensation of the protocol plan of God. Church age is how it is normally uh, described but the dispensation of the royal family of God is probably the most descriptive because it, it is the reason we're here God is forming a new royal family out of believers from all around the world anyone, any tribe, any tongue, any nation, any race anybody can believe and anybody can come into Bible class and learn. Isn't that beautiful? Point three, intercalation is the intensified stage of the angelic conflict. When you study the Bible, you'll find out the attacks against the humanity of Christ. And man, you would never believe how many a different attacks there were from Satan and his angels to try to keep Jesus from coming to earth. I mean, it was amazing. From the attack in the garden to the... Uh, well, Cain was even part of it. And then you have the uh, Genesis problem where you had the infiltration of the human race. 
And then, you know, we had the flood. You only had eight people that came through the, the end of that thing. And then you, you find out that, that Jesus is going to come through a certain line of, of Jewish believers. And, man, the, the concentration of attacks happen again and again and again. Even after Christ is born, what happens? Herod kills the babies. And throughout the life of Christ, and specifically the day of the cross, the torture that he went through, was Satan trying to keep him from going to the cross. But what happened? He was victorious. He went to the cross. He, he hollered out, what, Tetelestai. Not only that, he was resurrected and ascended. So that during that first pan, span of human history, you have attack, attack, attack. We've got to keep Jesus from coming as a man. We've got to keep him from going to the cross. We've got to keep him from uh, being uh, resurrected. We've got to keep him from ascending uh, into the third heaven. Christ was victorious on all accounts. Now he's seated at the right hand of God the Father, isn't he? He lives in heaven at the right hand of God in resurrection body. He's alive right now. Whoever will Satan attack with Christ absent? What should be our focus of attack, boys? It's you. And that's why you live in the intensified stage of the angelic conflict. Christ has already won the victory, and there's no one left to attack except the royal family of God. And that's why false doctrine is so prevalent in the church age. False teaching. So, the focus of satanic attack is the royal family in Christ's absence. We live in the intensified stage of the angelic conflict. Point four in the doctrine of intercalation. Doctrine, that's teaching from the Bible, pertaining to the church age, is called mystery because it was not known in the Old Testament or recorded through its writers. Romans 16, 25, and 26, Ephesians 3, 1 and 6, Colossians 1, 26 and 27. And this brings up a, a lot of, it ought to bring up a lot of clarity to your life, really, in the first attitude that every super grace believer has is, guess what? Thankfulness in all things. And if you're going to have a stellar attitude in life, you've got to first of all develop thankfulness in, guess what? All things. And one of the first things you ought to be thankful for is your own life. Because you do not have to be here. That so you are not necessary, but you are here. And therefore, we are thankful that God included us in creation.
feel like sometimes I'm giving you too much too quick. And one of the things I like to mention at this point is the parable of Uh, I don't know if it's called the wedding party. Let me see here if I can give it to you. Does anybody have any questions so far? The uh, the issue is is that we're part of creation, and that if Israel had gone after Jesus, for the most part, the church age would not exist. Does anybody argue that point? I think that what you'll find out is the fact that. Jesus offered Israel the kingdom when he was here on earth. And John the Baptist prepared the way. I mean, that was the point of John the Baptist's existence was to prepare the way for the Messiah. And what did he preach? He preached, the kingdom of God is at hand. And so we understand that that John the Baptist preached the kingdom of God and Jesus presented the kingdom of God to Israel. And he even told them in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 what it would be like if he came and set the kingdom up. What it would be like living in his kingdom which would have been the millennial reign. So here's what you would see. If the Jews as a whole, not all of them would believe, but if they had gone after Christ and they said, if the Pharisees had said, don't listen to us anymore. Jesus Christ, this guy from Nazareth is not just a carpenter. He is the Messiah. He's shown us. He is the man, the Christ. We're here. We now know Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. You see, they did do that. If they, if if Israel as a whole would have recognized Christ as the Messiah, he would have still gone to the cross. Ton of prophecy fulfilled in the cross. Psalm twenty-two, Isaiah fifty-three. But immediately after the resurrection, and I'm not sure how many days, but Jesus would have set up his kingdom. The millennium would have came to Israel. So what does that tell you about your existence? What does that tell you about being right here 2,000 years after the cross? We, we, see, we don't have to exist. But because Israel rejected Christ's kingdom, God the Father intercalated the church age, and he says, I'm going to form a new royal family to complement that victory on the cross, son. You watch what's going to happen. I'm going to invite people from all over the world, out from the ditches, the byways, the jungles, and all of them are going to be part of your new royal family. And when that family's complete, what's going to happen? It's over. So when your feet hit the floor in the morning, the thought ought to be, Thank you, God, for creating me. Thank you for imputing soul life to me. Thank you for dropping me right into the church age 
And not only that, in the United States of America, and for me, in Texas. I'm going to come back to you with the parable uh, that we're, that Jesus told. And it's, it's a parable of a party which the in original uh, uh, list of invitees did not attend. So the person that, fr that was going to throw the party and nobody wanted to come goes out and just starts inviting anybody. And the anybody is you. So we're looking at the doctrine of intercalation. It's extremely interesting. And not only that, it's the reason you're alive. You're here as a Gentile in the church age because of the doctrine of intercalation. Okay. I'm going to turn over to 1 Corinthians 11 now. There's only two rituals in the church age. One is water baptism. You do it one time. It represents joining union with Christ, the top circle. The other ritual is the Lord's table. You do it many times. It represents rejoining fellowship. The question is, who can take the Lord's table? And that's any believer. Any believer who understands rebound, you say, well, why do they need to understand rebound? Because in our verse, 1 Corinthians 11, 20, uh, 28, 29, and 30, it says, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, that means that he's got unconfessed sin in the life, eats and drinks judgment to himself, that means divine discipline, not discerning the Lord's body. And uh, the believers at Corinth had not been using rebound before they took the Lord's table. And he says in verse 30, For this reason many are weak, and sick among you, and many sleep. That means they're dead. So you've got warning, discipline, intensified misery, and the sin unto death because believers refuse to use the rebound technique before they took the Lord's table. So there's always a warning that comes along with it. Verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, that means we examine our own lives in the light of God's word, and use the rebound technique if needed, we would not be judged. That means we would not receive divine discipline. So, the question is, who can take the Lord's table? And the answer is, any believer, any believer who understands rebound. That means little kids don't need to take it because they don't really understand biblical confession of sin. And you have to throw in there the fact that weak believers walk in the door and they don't understand rebound or their own priesthood and what defiles their priesthood or what makes them clean in the priesthood so that every time we take the Lord's table, I try to slow down and give you a little shot across the bow. Hey, maybe you ought to review your, light, your life in the light of God's Word and if there's anything out of place, Go ahead and confess it to God the Father in Jesus' name and receive forgiveness and cleansing. The Bible doesn't say God's going to start out with warning discipline. And it doesn't say He's going to creep right up into war. Uh, excuse me. Start out with warning discipline, then creep up into intensified misery, and then give you a lot of, of leeway before He goes into the sin unto, unto death. He says right here in this passage, there are believers who were dead because they refused to use the rebound technique. You look at Ananias and Sapphira. How many stages of discipline did they go through before God took them home? 
None. So as a pastor, in my compassion, I reiterate every time, I try to every time, there's a special warning that comes with taking the Lord's table, and there it is. Okay. I want to ask Evan and Jalen, if y'all don't mind. There's only two elements in the Lord's table. Neither one of them or somehow anything other than a cracker and juice. But what they represent, uh, so these are not sacred in and, in and of themselves, but what they represent are totally sacred and possibly the most sacred. So there's some false teaching that says when you eat the bread, it turns into the Lord's body in your stomach. Or when you drink this juice, somehow it turns into blood. That's all false teaching. It's just a cracker. It's just juice. Neither one of these are sacred in and of themselves, but what they represent are totally sacred because one represents the person of Christ and the other represents the work of Christ. I want to take you through a few things because taking the Lord's table is actually a test. It's a test of concentration. It's a test of concentration on the doctrine that you have in your soul. So, in fact, in case you don't have much doctrine, I want to give you something to think about while you're taking the test. This cracker is uh, real. It has uh, matter, and it displaces time. There was some false teaching that said Jesus was a ghost. He was an apparition. He was a vision. Uh, he wasn't really a real man. He was just kind of a trance that people had, and they saw him no, no, and no. Jesus was absolutely human. He was absolutely born into a man's body. He absolutely existed. He actually walked on the earth for 33 years, and he displaced time, and he was a human created matter. Now, he is the only member of the Trinity who has a human body. God the Holy Spirit is spirit, and God the Father is spirit. You can't drive nails through either one of them. But Jesus Christ has a human body, and you can put a nail through him, and he can hang on a cross, and that's why he was born to go to the cross. Now, secondly, this cracker has no yeast, and yeast in the Bible represents sin, and Jesus was free from all three categories of sin. First of all, he didn't have a human father. God, the Holy Spirit, supplied the 23 chromosomes to fertilize that one cell in Mary's body called the female ovum. Different than you and I, because your father supplied the 23 chromosomes to fertilize that one cell in your mother's body and guess what came with it the genetically transmitted sin nature when that cell was fertilized it divided in two guess what came along the sin nature into four guess what came along the sin nature into eight and for nine months in the womb those cells divided and every cell was contaminated with guess what the old sin nature so that when you were born, God the Father looked down, he saw that beautiful baby, but guess what? It was contaminated. Every cell of your human body was contaminated with the old sin nature, and that meant there was a home or a target for the imputation of the second category of sin, Adam's original sin. He said, whoop, there's another one. Bam. There's the target. There's the imputation. You know what that means? You were born spiritually dead. Say, well, 
If I'd have been in the garden, I wouldn't have ate the forbidden fruit. I mean, I didn't really want Adam's sin imputed to me. Well, it was one of the greatest strokes of genius that ever came from the mind of God. Do you know why? He took your sins and imputed those to Christ and imputed Adam's one sin to you. That created the potential, potential for salvation. So that when you believed in Christ, God said yes and imputed his own righteousness to you. Now in Jesus' conception and birth, it was different because God the Holy Spirit supplied the 23 chromosomes to fertilize that one cell. When Jesus was born free from the sin nature, he was born spiritually alive and the only member of the human race qualified to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world. You see, it takes a free man to buy slaves. Jesus was also free from the third category of sin, that's personal sins. He never sinned personally. The Bible says he was tempted in all ways as we are, yet did not sin. And obviously, when you read the story of Jesus and you find that the Roman soldier drove the nail right through his hand, what did Jesus do? Did he curse? Did he fight? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He went to the cross impeccable. And so when you see this cracker and you recognize there's no yeast in it, you see that Jesus was the spotless Lamb of God without sin, without blemish. Finally, when you see the cracker, you recognize that it is the hypostatic union, the God-man. Jesus is not like man in that he is God. He is not like God, other two members, in that he is man. He is the unique person of the universe. He is not any less God because he is man. He's not any less man because he is God. It's without loss or mixture. And therefore, Jesus Christ is perfect God and perfect man in one person forever. He is the only member of the human race worthy of worship. He, in fact, is the only celebrity in the human race. Then you have the cup, and the cup in the Bible teaches the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ teaches Christ's substitutionary spiritual death on the cross. If you read the story of Jesus' crucifixion, you'll find out that he was arrested and he was punched by the 70 Sanhedrin until he was unrecognizable, yet he did not cry out in pain. He was whipped with a cat of nine tails, 39 stripes. It would have taken all the flesh from his back. Uh, his rib bones would have been visible. He never cried out in pain. He was impaled with a crown of thorns. He was beaten with a staff. He was mocked as king of the Jews, and he never cried out in pain. Even when he took the nails, he prayed for his persecutors. Yet at 12 noon, something supernatural happened. The Bible says darkness fell across the land. And Jesus began to scream over and over again, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? How is it that Jesus had go through all of the torture and never cry out in pain, and now he is hanging on the cross and begins to scream in agony? Corinthians tells us why. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, the Bible says that God the Father poured out the sins of the world on Christ on the cross and judged them there. 
1 Peter 2.24. The good news is that three hours later, Jesus cried out one word, Tetelestai, it is finished. That means the work of salvation was completed and all that is left for the human race to do is believe. I want to give you uh, the scripture now and we'll take the Lord's table. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take the bread. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take the cup. I'm going to pray with you, but don't run off. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for this ritual where we can remember the person and work of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for your word and the doctrine of intercalation and the fact that you have included us in your creation. And we are so thankful to exist and not only that, be the recipients of our so great salvation. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.